Thank you, Don. <clears throat> and a special welcome to our visitors. Um, hope you are blessed by today's service and the singing and, uh, and the fellowship and also uh, hopefully by this message. And just a reminder, um, everyone just hang back if you'd like after the uh, service and uh, spend some time with us with a cuppa and a biscuit together. All right, let's get into this, uh, this sermon this morning and we're looking at Genesis chapter 17. And we'll read from verses 15 to 22 as we continue our look at the life of Abraham and Lot. And today, interestingly enough, the focus is on Sarah. So for those of you who remember my last sermon, it was uh, focused around the, the covenant of circumcision. And I left out a particular portion which wasn't related to that, which is this passage we're reading now. And it flows quite well with today's special occasion. So Genesis chapter 17, verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him and God went up from Abraham. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll commit this time to him. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you that it is pure and precious and we can grow through it. And we pray that your spirit will be working within our hearts, teaching us your ways this morning. We thank you for this precious time that we can come together to learn from you. And I pray that you would simply use me as an instrument in your hand, hiding me behind your cross that only Jesus might be seen. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So as I've mentioned, last time I was sharing um, uh, a message with you, the focus was on the covenant of circumcision or circumcision as being a token or a sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. And the focus was obviously on the males. Okay, because it only had to do with the males. And so at that particular time, Abraham circumcised himself, circumcised Ishmael, and then all the men in his, uh, his family, and also his servants. And at that particular time, God changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. And if you remember what I described for that, is that God added his own name within Abraham's name, to essentially declare that Abraham belonged to him and identified with him now. Now we're going to see that God does the same for Sarah. And so in verse 15, he says there, God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. So you'll notice he does the same thing now to Sarah as he did with Abraham. And so he includes his name, which is that H, okay, in her name. So her name now would become a constant reminder to everyone around her that she was connected in a personal way to this one true God called Jehovah. Okay. God treasured Sarah as he treasured Abraham. She was special to him. She may not have understood it fully, but now he was making it very, very clear that she was connected to him just as Abraham was. And she was as essential to his covenant and to his plan as Abraham actually was. 
And so God made clear that she was special to him. And she had been faithful her entire life to the husband who her husband who God had called out of Mesopotamia to the land of Canaan. And she'd been faithful to him her entire life, not ha ever having seen God herself. You see, God had visited Abraham on a number of occasions, but she had never seen him. It was always with Abraham either in a dream or directly, as we see in this other passage, where God actually comes down and then goes up again. But she hadn't seen him before. But God recognized her faithfulness. And she's seen here now as a woman of great faith. Because in, obe in obeying her husband, who had been called by the Lord to follow him, she was being faithful to the Lord at the same time. And her faithfulness did not go unnoticed by God. And so in verse 16, he says, And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. How's that for Mother's Day message? We're looking at the mother of, just not just the mother, the mother of nations, the mother of kings and of people. And so if you recall, there was a particular time in Sarah's life where she despaired about her own position, where she offered Hagar, her servant, to her husband to so that he would take her for a wife because she didn't see herself in this picture at all. She's thinking, well, we're waiting more than 20 years here to have a child. I'm now over, I'm at, I, I, I past 80 years old. There's no chance I'm going to have, a, have a, a child. So what, what options do we have? Abraham, God's promised you a progeny. He's promised you descendants, as many as the stars. Maybe it's not through me. Take my servant, take her for your wife and and have children through her and which is what they actually did and so they be like she had lost hope that she was even part of this particular plan of god the one that would give birth to this line that was going to be as countless as the stars but now god was making very clear that she was even in her old age god saying no no you're not just going to be a mother you're going to be a mother of nations and kings and people and so today, as we honour mothers, it's just, well, there's no coincidences in God's, in God's economy. But we're looking at this particular woman uh, who is a wonderful example of being a mother and also enduring very hard and long times in her life, but remaining faithful all the way through. And so I think it's fitting that we honour Sarah today. We remember Sarah on this particular day. And so we must remember, Sarah is now 90 years old. Who's 90 years old here? Anyone 90 years old? Jean. Where's Jean? You there, Jean? Jean, she's not going to put up her hand. No chance of that. Um, 90 years old. Um, she was 90 years old when she had Isaac. So if you can imagine, she'd been called out of Ur along with her husband, when her husband came to her and said, I've seen God, God's spoken to me, and he's called us to leave Mesopotamia and travel to Canaan. Oh, well, where's that, Abraham? Got no idea. He wants us to go in that direction. And so she was about 65, I think, years of age. He was called when he was 75, is that right? And she was 10 years younger. So she's already 65 years of age. They hadn't had any children yet. Now she's reached... 90 years of age and still hasn't had a child but all those years god had been saying i'm going to make a covenant with abraham he's going to have descendants as the stars and so i can imagine the discouragement that she would have felt after being there year after year after year and waiting for this child to come and not knowing whether it was going to be through you or whether it was how you fit into this particular plan. But as you get older and older and older, I can imagine she, she would have become downhearted not to see the thing that she would have wanted most in her life, which was probably to have a child, but to be part of this covenant. So, it's a good message for women. 
it's a good message to remain faithful. That even though you may go through discouraging times, you may not see the greater plan that God has for your life, which she didn't, but yet she remained faithful. And I think that's true for all of us. We go, all go through times in our lives when things just don't seem to make sense. You may not see the big picture and God doesn't tend to reveal the whole plan to us from beginning to end. He knows it. But sometimes we're stuck in this particular thing and it seems to be dragging on for a long, long time and we don't seem to be getting an answer to our prayers or clarification about what God wants us to do. And so my counsel to you would be to learn from Sarah. Yeah, she would have gone through difficult times, but she remained faithful all the way through. She didn't stop being a faithful woman. She didn't stop continuing to do those things which she was called to do. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. As we see what, what the Bible says about Sarah's faithfulness and her faith, Despite the trials, despite the, the waiting, Sarah is now described for us as a woman of great faith, not just small amount of faith, but great. So in Hebrews 11, 11, it says, Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. And so did you notice what it says about Sarah's faith here? It says through faith she had the strength, she, she herself received strength to conceive C, which is obviously Isaac, but notice what it says, that it's because she judged him, that's God, faithful who had promised. And that's your foundation for faithfulness and faith. It's actually believing what God says. And it's holding on to the promises of God, despite what, me, what may be going on and around your life. And your circumstances and all of our circumstances change from day to day. Sometimes you might be sitting on top of a mountain. The next day you may be in a valley. Our lives change dramatically in short periods of time. And maybe there are times when you feel you're going through a drought in your life and nothing seems to be working out and you don't seem to be getting a, a complete picture or an answer. But Sarah here becomes an example to all of us in that she held on to the promise of God and she remained faithful. She judged him faithful who had promised. That's the foundation for a faithful life, to actually believe God and what he says is true. Her faith rested in the promise that God had made. And we're going to see that in the next chapter as well. So when things are not going well, when things seem dark or difficult, hold on to the promises of God and believe that he is always faithful faithful to his own word and so if you hold on to that you will be a person of faith and so there are plenty of promises if you're wondering where those promises are I can tell you that you have them sitting in your hands right now there are plenty of promises that God gives to his people and we're going to look at some of those briefly in this message as well so most people are aware that Sarah laughed. So most of you know the story about Sarah laughing. You've read it before and Sarah laughed and God says, you know, no, you know, I know you laughed. I heard you laugh, right? But most people are unaware that actually Abraham laughed as well at this particular promise. So look at verse 17 and 18. It says, then Abraham, after God had told him 
that Sarah was going to bear a child for him and his name was going to be Isaac. It says in verse 17 in Genesis 17, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. So Abraham was not only once again surprised to hear God's come to him and he said, no, 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 you're going to have another child and that's going to be through Sarah. So he's surprised and he's thinking in his mind, how can that possibly be? I'm going to be 100. She's going to be 90. Can I imagine her giving birth at 90 years of age? And so he, he does what's natural to, to, the, to the normal man and he thinks about the son that he's got who's already around 12 years old who he's been now with for those 12 years, and no doubt he's grown close to Ishmael. It's his son. And he says, what about this one? What about this one that I love? You know what I mean? Why don't you bless him? You know, I don't want to be grasping at things that I don't have yet, but what about the one that I have? Bless this one over here. The one who's already been circumcised. I've already circumcised. God, that was not an easy job. You got me to circumcise myself and him, He's part of the covenant, isn't he? And so when you think about Abraham's response, yes, he would have thought, wow, that's a huge thing. That's a huge mountain to climb for me and Sarah to have another child. But how about we take this particular road, Lord? You've already given me this one. How about we go through this? I love this son. I don't want him to be left on the side. And so Abraham's response is one of a loving father. One who doesn't want to see his son put to the side. And so he says, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. He wanted Ishmael to live. He wanted Ishmael, Ishmael to be blessed by the Lord. But the Lord's plans were different to what Abraham had with, within his heart. And so in verse 19, God responds. And he says, and God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And they shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. The beautiful part about this thing, even though God didn't answer Abraham's prayer directly, he did answer it. He, I, Ishmael was not part of God's covenant that he had planned, but he says to Abraham, I've heard your prayer. I know your heart and your love for your son, and don't worry. I've already blessed him and I will bless him from this point on. He is not only going to be blessed, he's going to be a nation himself. And so God indeed would bless Ishmael and 12 princes would come from him as well, which is almost a, a, a similar thing to happen with, with Isaac. So Isaac then has Jacob, Jacob has 12. So there's, a, there's almost like a parallel thing running here but the lesson in here for us and i know abraham's heart for his son was he wanted the very best for him um but god does hear our prayers he heard abraham's prayer he understood abraham's love for his son and the lord does see the love that we have for our own children he does see the love that we have for our family he does understand our prayers and he hears our prayers and he wants to bless them too. And this is what's important for us to understand is that our prayers are important and that we should never leave off from praying for those that we love. We should never give up hope for those who are not saved, for those who don't know the Lord, for those who we want to see blessed as we are blessed. Because when we pray for those people that we love, we pray for those that are closest to us. God sees our heart and he answers our prayers. So don't ever, ever stop from praying for those people that are close to you because God not only sees your, he is your prayers, 
He knows your heart. And where those prayers honour him and bring him glory, he will indeed answer those prayers. And God fulfilled Abraham's prayer for his son. And God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. And through Abraham, God blessed Ishmael and he would bless Isaac. And we are here today because through Abraham we've been blessed as well because his descendant has blessed us completely. Genesis 12, 2. Just turn back there for a moment. The promise that God had made when he called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees was that he would not only make Abraham a great nation, but look at verse Genesis 12, verse 2. I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now let me remind you this morning that the same is true of us. God has called us to be the light in this world. God has called us to be the salt of the earth. God has called us to be the ambassadors to this world. He has called us his children in this world. We are different to everyone else. And through us, God blesses this world. If we were removed from this world, this world would not be going through a very good time. And I know that when the rapture happens and God removes his people from the world, the world will go through the most difficult time it has ever, ever gone through. And that's because you, you need to understand, we need to understand that God blesses this world through us. He uses us to bless this world. Just as he said to Abraham, you will be a blessing. He has said the very same things to us. Now, let me read you some scripture verses. Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, right? But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, you can't get a more worse description for someone than that. They hate you. They, they want to do bad to you. They, they despitefully use you and they persecute. Can you, think, can you think of anyone worse? No. But yet he tells us here to love them, bless them, do good to them and pray for them. Okay. So in doing that, we become a blessing to this world. Romans 12, 14 says, Bless them. This is the Apostle Paul now speaking. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. So we are called to enter into the sufferings of the people in this world. People who don't have God, don't understand God. People who are completely bamboozled by what's going on, are confused, who are living in darkness. We are called to enter into their darkness. Not to be darkness ourselves, but to shine God's light for them. Because without the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, without our example and our love toward them, what hope do they actually have of ever being saved? Of ever understanding the love of God? Peter repeats the same thing. In 1 Peter 3.9 he says, Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrary wise, blessing knowing that ye are there unto called and that ye should inherit a blessing. We are called never to pay back, never to fight back, never to hate back, never, never to persecute back, never. That is not our calling. We are called to be a blessing to this world. And through us, God blesses people who are living in darkness. Just as Abraham was a blessing to Ishmael, his son. He loved Ishmael, his son. Now, Ishmael wasn't part of the covenant. There are plenty of people around us who are not part of God's new covenant, are they? We are called to love them the same. Through us, the Lord is able to bless others. Through our prayers, the Lord reaches people's hearts and they find salvation. When we share the good news with people, when we share the gospel and people are blessed with eternal life, when we show kindness and mercy and love and grace, 
people see the character of God in us and they turn to him. Remember, every word we speak, every act of love that we show, every example that we are, every time we are faithful to God's word, God plants a seed in someone else's life. And our prayer is that that seed will produce fruit to salvation. So never, ever give up on that. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Because there's going to come a day when even though they may speak against you and me as evildoers, as people who are hateful, as people who are evil or stupid or ignorant or whatever else they may say about us, there will come a day when God receives the glory. Because we have simply been faithful. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it says, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Now, your conversation is your lifestyle. It's what they see of you. It's what they hear from you. It's that integrity that you have between what you say you believe and what you do in front of them. So having your conversation honest, not without, without hypocrisy, but honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you, as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. They may not get saved. They may look at you and persecute you and, and speak all manner of evil against you when you seek to do them good. But in the end, you know who we are doing it for? Ultimately, for God. We're doing it for the Lord. And it's when we don't do the things that he's called us to do is when we rob him of his glory. When we enter into the, the ways of the world, when we enter into the, their way of thinking and begin to behave like them is when we rob God of his glory and we fail. And so Abraham showed an amazing love for Ishmael and God answered his prayer. So don't stop praying. Don't stop being an example to your families. Pray for all men. Pray for all men and don't stop because the time is short and the days are evil. But the Lord's covenant would not be established through Ishmael. It would be established through Isaac. And for the first time, God not only, not only confirms that, that, that Sarah will have a child, but he confirms that this kid's name is going to be Isaac. Where's Isaac? He's gone. <laughs> Literally, the kid's name means have a laugh. To laugh. Okay? Um, and Abraham laughed within himself when he heard this promise that God had made. Now turn with me to Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. Abraham laughed in amazement and I suppose in a sense incredulity. Genesis 18 1. Because now the Lord's come back to him. Sometime later, we don't know exactly how long, God has appeared to him. And it says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of memory. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now, Abraham had been visited a number of times by the Lord already. And so when he saw the Lord and these other two that were with him, he recognized him pretty quickly. And so he runs from, and I think a, a tent door, it's not just the hole in the, in the tent where you walk in, but there would have been like a veranda covering over that. And he would have been sitting under that in the cooler because it would have been warmer in the, in the actual tent itself. But you would have been sitting under that, that shade. And he was probably just sitting there having a bit of a, a drink or whatever else he was doing. And he sees these three men approach and he recognized immediately, hey, that's him. He's coming toward me. And so he recognizes him and he, and he rushes towards him and he bows himself to the ground. But this time something's different. He hasn't come alone. You see, all the previous times he'd come by himself. But now he's got two others with him 
And we're going to discover that those two others are the two angels that have come with the Lord. Two angels that God will send as witnesses against Sodom and Gomorrah. And we'll see that in the, the next chapter. And so he, what do you do? God's visited you. He's come to your tent with two other angels. And they look in physical form. They're not like ghosts. They are in physical form. And what do you do? Well, you invite them in. Okay? If you're a hospitable sort of person, which Abraham obviously was, you say this. And he said in verse 3, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. I pray thee from thy servant, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that, ye shall pass on. And therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. And so Abraham thinks to himself, wow, what an opportunity. I'm going to have God actually at my tent. Okay, and so he says to him, "Look, look, don't don't pass, don't don't go just yet. Just hang around for a bit. I'll get you some water. We'll wash your feet. We'll refresh you a little bit, and I've had something to eat. Then you can you can uh, go on." Now, let me ask you a question: What would you do if God visited you at your house? What would you do if Jesus came knocking on your door? Take me now. <laughs> Take me now. <laughs> you'd hold on to the ankles, huh? So you'd. Uh, so when he went, you'd go up with him. Um, what would you do if Jesus came and visited you where you were? Wouldn't you want him to stay? Yeah. So Abraham's, I think, thinking the same thing. Okay. How do you get someone to stay um, and spend more time with you? Well, one of my favorite ways of doing it is eating. And if you haven't noticed at Faith Baptist Church, everything revolves around eating. Whether it's banana splits, whether it's uh, cheese nights and everything else there's always some sort of food going on somewhere because historically for thousands of years people have sat down and spoken and gotten to know each other better over a meal and so abraham's thinking wow what a beautiful opportunity i have to get to know the lord better and actually have this conversation with him and so he does that you feed them you offer them hospitality and it reminds me of of an encouragement the apostle paul actually gives to all of us in hebrews 13 too if you recall he says be not forgetful to entertain strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares so hey they're still walking around we don't know who they are but he says entertain angel entertain strangers which means welcome people who you don't know into your home Entertain doesn't mean I'm going to put on a song and dance for them, okay? Entertain means to feed them, to welcome them, to make them feel like they're loved. And so there's, there's a call to all of us to be hospitable, not just to the people that we know, but the people that we don't know. Because the people that we don't know are the ones whom God will, ble will cause us to be a blessing to them and may be a blessing to us as well. And so there's an encouragement for there for us as well so all right so abraham says hang back a bit we'll wash your feet we'll give you some water you can refresh yourselves a bit and then you know we'll you know we'll give you have a piece of bread or whatever else he says a morsel a morsel is not a large amount right a morsel is a, a bit of bread he goes and then you can you know you can you can go on your way after that and so they say yes they answer him and they say yes okay and so verse 6 then says, And Abraham hasted into the tent unto Sarah. You can imagine that whole, Sarah, hurry up. If you're Italian, get the pasta ready. Hurry up, get it boiling. Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. You know that special recipe you got for those cakes, Sarah? The ones that I like? the ones that everyone likes, make three batches of those, right? And get them cooking. And so he then he runs to the, to the herd and fetches a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto the young man and he hastened to dress it. So he gets, he gets a calf and he says, hurry up, slaughter it and get it ready. We're going to have a barbecue as well. 
So from from offering them some bread, <laughs> then passing on, this guy's gone now and full blown a full blown barbecue and uh, and, and feast. And it says he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. What a beautiful picture of, of, uh, of communion, fellowship with God. You know, he didn't make them a coffee and biscuits, did he? You know, he didn't say, yeah, here's a couple of Tim Tams for you. And, you know, and what do you want? Latte or a, uh, or a Nescafe? He prepares them a full meal with cakes and cheese and, and butter and, and everything else. He does a full barbecue for them. And here they are under a tree having a picnic together with God. Isn't that a, a lovely, lovely thought? Um, can you imagine the conversations that would have taken place? You know, by the time you slaughter a calf and get it ready and then barbecue it, and you're talking some serious time here. So imagine the conversations. It doesn't tell us all the conversations that they had, but no doubt he's had some good time of fellowship together with the Lord. And I wonder, as Sarah's there <laughs> getting the cakes ready, no doubt she would have known who she was getting it ready for as well. And this is the first instance where we have recorded that Sarah actually sees God face to face. She hadn't seen him before. And here he is, God, with two other angels, and she's getting cakes ready for him. How's that for a thought? One of the greatest joys a mother has is seeing her children eat, is it not? And seeing her children grow through the food that she prepares for them. And so you can imagine the excitement that Sarah has preparing a meal for God. Uh, the God of the universe. I don't know if he's going to like my cakes. I wonder if he's going to appreciate the, the effort that I put into them. So there's this excitement that must be building in her as well. And this is a thought, of, just an amazing thought when you think you can be sitting under a tree having a picnic with God and he's eating the food that you prepare for him. Um, as Abraham prepared the feast for the Lord, I want you to rem remind yourself that one day we are going to be sitting at a feast together with him. Abraham got to do it under a tree with him. But we know that one day there's going to be this huge feast that God's going to put on for us. You know, this day when, and if you remind yourself, you are the bride of Christ, the bride of his son. And one day we're going to be united with him and God's going to put on this massive party. And actually turn to Revelation chapter 19 with me. Revelation 19.7, as we, as we just remind ourselves that there's going to be a marriage supper that's going to happen. And that is going to be a glorious, glorious day. When we can sit at a table and enjoy a banquet with God. So Revelation 19.7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, that's you, hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So one day we are going to enjoy a meal with God, and we are going to sit with God and enjoy his company. So until that day, we've got that amazing wedding to look forward to, but also that time of fellowship together. And so now the conversation turns to Sarah, who is in the tent. And so these guys, so there's God, the, the two angels. Abraham says he's standing there watching them eat. And they have their back to the tent. But Sarah is an earshot of what they're saying. Or if she can hear exactly what they're saying. So they're, they're pretty close to, to where the actual tent is. And so it says there in verse uh, 9 of Genesis 18, it says, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? As if he didn't know. And he said, Behold, in the tent. There she is. She was sitting in the, in the same place, the door, okay? In the door, listening no doubt, wanting to know what was going on. And he said, 
And he says, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and were stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. She wasn't having her monthly cycles, that's for sure, probably for a very, very long time. Now, Sarah hears this promise of God. She hears it herself with her own ears coming from the mouth of God that she is going to have a child. And no doubt Abraham would have told her that God had said this before in the previous encounter that he had with God. But now she was hearing it for the first time from God himself, from God's own mouth. But Sarah's well past the age of having children. And so she's there sitting in this, in this tent door watching God and those angels eating uh, her food and having that communion time. And she's thinking to herself, that's just way too fantastic for me to take in. How on earth can I actually see myself being a mother now? And so it says in verse 12, she laughed within herself. It says, therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, <laughs> after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? You do realize that to make a baby, it takes two. Huh? And she's saying, I'm 90 years old and he's 100. Are we going to have pleasure now making a baby? You know, have you ever heard... Have you ever heard um, news that was so good, so fantastic that you struggled to actually accept it? And you had to laugh with yourself saying, no, that can't be true. That can't be true. You know, this, this laughter shouldn't be taken in a sense that she was mocking God at all, but that she had heard something that was so amazing, so fantastic, and she can't picture in her head how she's going to fit into that. You know what I mean? Because the first thing you do is you're thinking, how? Yeah. And so she's within her, she's got joy at hearing such amazing words, but at the same time, confusion, because these, these blocks aren't fitting together. Okay. And so it says that she laughed within herself. Now it doesn't say that she laughed out loud, like, ha ha ha. She laughed within herself, but within her own mind, it must have been swirling in there. How can this be? How can I, me have a, have a child that's, you know, when I'm so old, how can I have pleasure in conception? How could I, can I picture myself having a baby and holding that baby in my hands? Can I, you know, can, can I have the joy of raising a child now at this age? You know, and being with him and, and you know, and, and feeding him and looking after him. She's thinking to herself, how does that even work? And so it says that she, she laughs within herself. And verse 13, it says, And the Lord said unto Abram, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? She didn't do it out loud. She did it within herself. And God says, she laughed. Uh, don't think that God doesn't know your thoughts. Don't think that God doesn't understand how you feel. One of the biggest pains that we have as people is, is wanting other people to understand what we feel. You ever tried to express how you're feeling to someone else? That's a bit of a lost cause sometimes, isn't it? We might explain what's going on. You might explain your argument. But can, can another person actually understand what you feel inside? That's hard. But God not only understands the words that we speak, the words that we imagine in our minds, that we're speaking to ourselves, but he also understands the feelings of our heart. He understood exactly what Sarah was, was thinking and also what she was feeling, the amazement and the laughter that she had inside her. Remember that God knows exactly what you feel. He knows exactly what you're thinking. And he always understands what you're going through. 
He knows your struggles. He knows your prayers. Whether you speak a word out loud or whether you don't, he understands every, every ounce of you. Uh, and there is no one who understands you better than God does. His knowledge of us is perfect in every possible way. And so that's a good thing for us. Maybe scary for us too. Because maybe there are some things that we don't want God to know, but he knows them anyway. But the good thing is, is that there is no reason to hide anything from God. Because you can't. So don't hide anything from God. Whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is that you are struggling with, share it with God because he already knows. And so in sharing it with God, you hand over your burden to him. And the honesty that we have with God opens up his door of grace to us. Now, the Bible says that when you try to cover a sin, when you try to conceal something, you actually cause yourself more problems. You actually heap judgment on yourself. So don't cover anything. God knows exactly what's going on in your heart and in your mind. And he knows that we struggle with these hearts because they are deceptive above all things. He knows that we struggle with the old nature and he wants to grant us the grace to overcome it. But you can't overcome it if you're concealing it. You can't overcome it if you deny it. Because then you won't acquire the cure. To deny that you have an illness or to deny that you have something wrong with you, like many men do when they, when they feel sick and they pretend as if nothing's wrong, uh, doesn't actually fix the thing, does it? It's only at the point where you say, okay, I've got a problem, is a time when you say, God, I've got a problem, but I'm going to trust you with it. I need your grace to help me through it. That's why Matthew 6, 7 says, But when you pray, use not vain repetition. Before you even speak to them, to him. And the thing we need the most is his grace. The truth of the matter is that despite what obstacles we face, what burdens we have, um, we can know that nothing, nothing is too hard for him. And nothing is outside of his understanding. Nothing is outside of his reach. And God is going to repeat now in verse 14 as we wrap this up, even though she laughed, right, within herself, and he knew that she laughed within her own heart and within her own mind, he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And so the answer to that question, is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer to that is, absolutely not. It is there is nothing that's too hard for the Lord. So when you pray, pray with faith, pray with confidence, because God can do anything. And so it says Sarah in verse 15 denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. You know, you can look at that and say, Oh, he told her off, right? Because she said, I didn't laugh. But in her mind, she didn't laugh on the outside, did she? She didn't laugh out loud. But he's now, he's now reading what she's got going on inside. Okay? And it says that she was afraid. She didn't want to offend him now. You see, Sarah was, from all accounts here that we see about Sarah's life, she was very humble and respectful. She called her own husband Lord. And so... To offend God in that way would have been something that she would never ever have imagined that she would do. She was afraid of doing that. So it says that she was afraid and she said, no, no, I didn't laugh. And he goes, but you did. I know that you laughed because you laughed within and I can hear the laugh from inside you. So that's not where it finishes. She laughed. And Abraham laughed. But I'm going to get you to turn to Genesis 21, 
verses 4 to 6 as we wrap it up now. I know I've jumped ahead, but in Genesis 21, verse 4, she has given birth to Isaac. The promise has come true. God's come through. And it says, And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful thought? That the conclusion of the story is that we can laugh with Sarah. We can say, what a fantastic thing that God did. He took something that was the exact opposite of what you would normally expect, and he went ahead and did it. He was able to fulfill his promise to you, even though it looked impossible. That is a good reason to laugh. Good love story. What's that? Good love story. A good love story as well, yeah. And so we can laugh with Sarah today because the Lord came through. But I want you to I want to close with this thought. Have you thought about the promises that God has made to you today? Have you thought about what you've already received from him? You see, Sarah laughed. Because she received something that she wasn't worthy to receive. It wasn't something that she, that she deserved, nor was she capable of actually earning herself. God gave her something that was miraculous. And yet here we are today, and we've received a new birth. We've received eternal life as a gift I'm telling you today, we should be laughing every day of our lives at what God's done for us. We should be laughing along with Sarah who rejoiced that God gave her a son. But you and I have been given the son of God as a gift. And we never deserved him. We still don't. So rejoice. There's a lot of reason to joy. There's a lot of reason to be laughing every day celebrating what God has done for us because the scriptures tell us as it is written I hath not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the thing which the things which God has prepared for them that love him but the second part of this particular equation is that God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. This morning, as we celebrate Mother's Day, I want to remind you that God is organizing a wedding. And we're part of that wedding. Okay? And God has given us something that's most precious. And we didn't deserve it. And we should be rejoicing every day of our lives because we have been given Christ. And he has told us things that, that are waiting for us that the world has no idea about, but we know them. If Sarah can be astonished at what was coming for her, how much more astonished should we be? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. It's been good to have you, with, have you with us today, everybody. I wonder if you have any blessings. Blessings when you come to church, blessings for your family, blessings from your mother, blessings from those that you come in contact each and every day, that they be a blessing to you and you be a blessing to them. So folks, a good closing hymn is number 370. Count your blessings. 370 as we conclude today. Stay if you can for a cup of tea and a bit of fellowship afterwards. But now we're going to sing on 370 and we shall sing 1, 2 and 4. I'll change it a bit. 1, 2 and 4. When upon life's billows we are singing 370 together. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed When you are discouraged thinking all is lost Count your many blessings, name them one by one, 
and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Two. Are you ever burdened with the Lord of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. On four together. So in the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Do you have some blessings? Do you have things you can count each day? Think about that as we enter a new week. The Lord will have you as being a blessing to those around you and you'll be blessed also in the many things you do. Let's be dismissed now in a word of prayer and pray that you'll be with us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Again, we thank you for the blessings to be able to gather here. We thank you for the freedom, Lord, that we have to meet and be able to, with no interruption, that we're able to meet and worship you, sing unto you praises. We thank you for the hymn writers of old that wrote these hymns that we can sing. And we pray that uh, you'll help us uh, as we learn from them each time we sing a hymn. Thank you for the opportunity to have our pastor with us today and for the message that went forth. Lord, that you would be uh, uh, with us as we enter a new week. 